Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. My name's Paul John Dykes and today I'm joined by Laura. Hello. Welcome to the show and today we are delighted to be in the presence of Susie McCabe. Susie, welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, a friend of mine uh, sent a message said, listen, I've got a great guest for a Celtic State of Mind, Susie. She was in the shop and she, she would love to do it. So let's talk a wee bit about your love of Celtic. Susie, growing up, who was the team that you were most fond of? Uh, so my introduction to the club was probably from the day now where I was born. I've got an older brother; he's eight years older than me. Uh, Celtic daft, and my I was particularly close to my nana and my papa growing up. Uh, my papa passed away when I was I was still quite young, but he uh, they they two and and my dad pretty much instilled that, that Celtic was your team. But I grew up in the East End. I grew up in Garrett Hill. And I could actually see the stadium from my mum and dad's bedroom. You could see it. And, and my brother used to go to the games when I was a kid and I was too young to go. And then I get taken to my first game in the centenary season. What a season. What a Fantastic. season to start going to the game. Mm-hmm. And you think, this is amazing. Is it like this every year? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 Buckle yourself in. <laughs> aye, aye. So uh, probably, oh God, and it pains me to say it, but it was that team with like um, Andy Walker. You know, he was, he was mm. you know, Packy Bonner, just loved him. Uh, Anton, it wasn't a love about Anton, eh? And then you obviously had to go through the 90s and we had to live through Wayne Biggins. Uh, Andy Payton, oh jeez, it wasn't easy. And then obviously you had Tommy's team. You know, 1995. We're gaining a bit of pride with Tommy, weren't we? Ah, uh, I and just the way we played. You know, the way we played football. It was literally we we played pure inventive football. It mm-hmm. was it was wonderful. And then from that, it was it was Wim the Tim. You know, and what a what a season that was. You know, I was 18 years old, and it was just it was incredible. And you know, I remember getting put out the cup by Motherwell. I think that was 92, 93 and just I remember walking up to the stadium and guys literally stopping you from going in because they were like we need to hold this board to account mm. and you know the socialist worker and everything like that and as much as what people say oh football's changed and everything's different and look at the stadium there's still something familiar about that walk up to the stadium even though the area around the stadium has changed there's still something you could be back in 1988, you could be in 1998, you've got the scarf, you're wrapped up, you know, you're, you're walking in and the songs are being sung and it's just, oh, it's amazing. It never loses that. I always look at uh, Springfield Vaults, you could be in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> aye, 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 1870. I'm amazed that Bolden's still standing. Aye, 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 aye. And it's just, aye, it's, 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 I mean, the stadium's looking great and the surrounding area's dramatically improved, but... Aye, it's, you're still just walking up to paradise. Mm, absolutely, and yeah. I still get the same buzz. I mean, we've spoken a lot on a Celtic state of mind because we try and speak to people with a bit of culture, be that art, comedy, film, music. And I keep asking people, what is it about Celtic fans? What is it that when we look at these creative people, there's so many of them Celtic fans? You know, what do you? Th- what's your take on that, Susie? I think, for me, it's a kind of Celtic thing. I think for me, it's a Celtic thing. If we want to just get straight in at the point of the matter, there's probably a Catholic thing there as well, in this country. The way society was set up, Scottish society was set up, um, you know, after the Reformation, and and Catholics were oppressed, and all that kind of stuff, and then, I mean, straight, I mean, you could probably take that right back to the mid to late 80s, if not further. Uh, there's probably still, in fact, no doubt, elements of it still going on. I think the Celtic thing of of sitting around and, and, you know, wakes or family parties and stuff like that, we have that thing where somebody gets a guitar out, somebody does a turn, that's very much a thing. But I think you can, 
associate where you have been oppressed, you will you will find people eventually coming out in the creative side of that. So you will find the working class. Like there was an argument recently, I think it was Damien Lewis who told uh, Julie Walters to shut up about the working class being in the arts. And Julie Walters says, no, yeah, I was the working class in the arts. I get a scholarship because you need that grit. That That's so, so important that you need that kind the hardship that comes from that. And I think that's very much the same with regards to us talking about Celtic and the creative flow. We were oppressed. Like, my dad was still oppressed when I was a kid over trying to get certain jobs in certain companies. And I think... When you're down like that, that is the way to hold on to your culture and hold on to your values. And it's it's in song, it's in poetry, it's in the written word, it's in the spoken word. And it's so important because if you don't have that, what what do you have? It gives a bit of colour and a bit of light, a bit of hope yeah. to the oppression that you're describing, the darkness of that. And Yeah, if you look at black Americans um, and the slaves and you go back and you look at that, you will hear all about the songs mm-hmm. that were sung in the chain gang, work in the fields. And you can you can apply that to the Highland Clearances or you can apply that to Catholics in Scotland. Um, and, and do you know what? You can also apply it to the Jewish population from like the Hungarian famine and then the, they move into America. And if you, uh, if you look at Broadway and, and any kind of shows that have been written... The, like Rogers and Hammerstein and stuff like that, like like Guys and Dolls, <laughs> West Side Story. All these things were written by two types of people in New York, homosexuals or Jews, um, and both of whom is a section of society who were on the fringes. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's how we operate as human beings. And for us, being in, being in Scotland, not even so much being Roman Catholic, just identifying is not being the establishment. Mm-hmm. I don't even think it's it's a particular Catholic thing nowadays. I think it's it's not being the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. I think if you're anything other than that, you're on the fringes. I think there's also a thing of where there is oppression and where there is darkness and where there is hard times. Now, regardless if that be in a personal level or a sociological level, you find solace and comfort and togetherness and and being as one that's so important and that they don't care about that because ultimately they're calvinists you know i mean (laughs) they're not even lutherians it's absolute presbyterian calvinism it's fucking grey doer misery hard working and you know what? See if they had their way, they would still have us walking down the street oh, with right. the arse hanging out the back of right. our trousers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we talk a lot about inclusivity as well, and yeah. Celtic being an inclusive club. Aye. And recently, there's an announcement that Rangers are going to be an inclusive club. What was your thoughts when you saw that <laughs> video? As a as a gay woman, what was my thoughts <laughs> in that video? My thought was, you only need an inclusion policy when you've had an exclusion policy. Uh, that to me, and I understand the sentiment behind it, so it's a positive sentiment and it's a positive message, which as someone who identifies as a lesbian, that's a great thing, right? However, my problem is when that all falls down is when it comes to the stance. Because I have always felt that that club isn't particularly inclusive. Um Now, you can go the way back to 1988 and Mo Johnson and whatever else, right? But since then, we've had Roman Catholic captains of Rangers. But it kind of runs deeper. And just signing a Catholic doesn't fix all the world's ills Mm -hmm. or just, you know, putting a pair of rainbow laces on doesn't fix it. Um, And I I noticed when Scott Brown being positive about Mm -hmm. a gay player, he doesn't care as long as they play well on the pitch. That's all he cares about. And then all of a sudden on Twitter... It was, oh yeah, getting a beast in, you know how they like gays. And the absolute link between paedophilia and homosexual consenting males was nothing short of disgusting. And if we are still living in a world where 50,000 people can pitch up in a stadium, sing about ethnic cleansing, and then link homosexual men to paedophiles, 
they've got a long way to go. It's going to take more than a poster with a guy in an army uniform, you know, and, and that's that's a mindset, and that's a mindset that will have to be mined. I mean, what would that have been? Three years ago, four years ago, Scott, Scott Sinclair got the monkey? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Aye. Like, so all of a sudden, what, we're including people? Oh, Scott Brown, yeah, I'm all for gay players. Aye, oh, aye, child abuse, you know how the gays like, like children? No, no, they don't, mate. And I think if you look at the stats and that, you'll find out that it's actually straight white men who, mm. who tend to enjoy children more than gay men. But they're not willing to open themselves up to that. And as long as you're still singing songs about battles 400-odd years ago, you're, um, you, you've got a long, long way to go. You know, they're not... They're not putting a rainbow flag in the top of the Sandy Jardin stand, are they? Because that would be a message, wouldn't yeah. it? Mm-hmm. Or a rainbow flag with a, a, a Scotland flag and a Union flag above the door of Ibrox. Yeah, if that's what you want to do, I would actually go fair do. You've, you've, you've done the step. But just coming out and saying you've got an inclusion policy, no, you need to do more than that. Absolutely. And uh, sending Mark Haley down to Gay Pride, isn't he? <laughs> Is no, it's no solving the real issue because the real issues are the bums and the seats and the stands mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that attitude. And like I said, I hear Celtic fans singing songs that I don't agree with. It doesn't always make me feel comfortable. But I look at these boys and I go, you're 18, you were born long after the Good Friday Agreement was signed and you've never really lived through that or seen that Yeah, from a historical perspective. And also, Wolf Tone was a Protestant, so calm down, son. But I can say hand on heart, that is an element of our support. Whereas I look at that other side and I go, I oh, know it's the majority. Yeah. It's the minority, I find, who say, we need to get rid of that song. Mm-hmm. We need to stop being associated with the Orange Order. You know, but they can't, the majority can't, can't see the demarcation between club and the association of oppressing Catholics, which is just bonkers in 2019. They can they can disassociate club from company, though. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> Going for 55. <laughs> Another thing that keeps coming up is the ability. I, I always think back to a game, I think it was 92 at Tynecastle, right? And uh, we took the lead through Tommy Coyne. What and a And they hammered us in the second half, three, and it was 3-1. And the Celtic fans, it might have been earlier, maybe 91, we started singing Always Look on the Bright Side. We are taking the piss out of ourselves. And there was that self-deprecating humour. Yeah. And I've always found that, you know, within the Celtic support. Um, is that something, again, that you can identify with? Oh, 100%, yeah. And I think as a stand-up, I, I, I self-deprecate a lot. And I normally do it at the top of a set or, or the top of a show because I think then that instantaneously gives the audience... A kind of bit of, you know, they can breathe that that you're not taking yourself too seriously. So you're not just out to pick on them, and you're not willing to make yourself just the hero for your own ego. And I think there's something in that. And you know, I, I'll be honest, having been doing stand up eight and a half years, whenever I watch a comedian over the course of a period of time, and I don't see them self deprecate, they're never particularly successful comedians. And you're just taking yourself far too seriously if you can't self-deprecate. And I think we are more than happy to look inwardly and laugh at ourselves. Uh, I talk a lot about being brought up Catholic and stuff like that, and and I will poke fun at that. And then and, and sometimes, like, especially in Glasgow, you can have a few, ooh, and I'll always say, listen, you cannot boo a Roman Catholic homosexual because they've said worse things about me than I have them. And it's that kind of thing of going, they are guilty of a lot, but you know what? I'm I'm going to poke fun at some things, but ultimately that is who I am. And that kind of defines me as well as everything else that defines me. So as much as what I'll poke fun at it, I still know that that's where I came from. And I have the ability to look inwardly see the problems with it and then commentate on it I think when you're the establishment that's a very difficult thing to do Mm -hmm. as you can see from the state the country's in just now Could you think Laura of anything worse than trying to get on a stage and make people laugh that fills me with dread you know the dread of trying to say something funny and it just absolutely you know sinks if if you're in a comedy club and someone tells you there's a comedian 
coming on, you're expecting them to be funny. So mm-hmm. already you're kind of willing to to give them that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and what you'll find is every audience wants you to do well because if you do well, they'll have a good night. Uh, if you're going to say something that's going to upset them, it's up to you to judge how you pitch that. You may pitch it differently from one night to another or you may decide to take it out. But yeah, that, that whole thing of you need to go and invoke a reaction and it's the hardest reaction to invoke. Mm. You know, there's sometimes I can be on stage and there'll be someone just sitting staring at me like wishing. I'm thinking they just they just wish I was dead. And then you come off stage and they're like, that was, that I have never laughed and I'm like, tell your face. Just tell <laughs> your face. When did you find... Uh, find out that you made people laugh. You were funny. And when did I mean? Did you buzz off that straight away? Uh, I I think I've I've always been an idiot my whole life. Like I think like my brother tells me that he used to come in from school, and uh, we we stayed in Thornbridge Road in Garrah Hill at the time. And I was I was like three, and he'd come in from school, and there would be my mum, my nana, and I'd be putting on shows and dancing and making them laugh. And he goes, "You were always that kid." And then you were always the person in the kitchen at a party, just having a laugh and telling stories. And it's it's just what we do. It's very much a West Coast of Scotland thing, isn't it? We, we just huddle around, we get a drink, we have the crack. And I think as well, there's probably... I knew when I was growing up that I was gay. And so I think I thought, I'm, I'm, this is wrong, because it was, you know, the 90s and we still had Section 28 and... It was very much frowned upon, and, and younger listeners won't understand that, but it was very much a secret thing, and, and you felt, I kind of felt the guilt about it. So I think I was always the joker and funny, just to detract mm-hmm. anybody from looking that, just as a form of deflection. And so yeah, so they, so they couldn't find that out. Um, so I think there's probably an element of that. And I th- I, yeah, I think it's just what we do. I, it, it's funny. I, I put a thing up on Facebook the other day. Like, uh, every teacher my whole life was like, McCabe, shut up. Nobody wants to listen to you. And now I'm like, I think you'll find they fucking do. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Again, how do you go from holding court in a kitchen at a party to taking that massive step to getting on a stage and going into comedy clubs? So for me... Uh, I had a friend who got diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. She was given 18 months to live. And me and another friend, a mutual friend, were in my house. We did curry, we had lots of drinks. And he was saying how you never know the minute. He said, what we should do is we should challenge ourselves and we should scare ourselves. And I said, look, I cannot jump out a plane. He went, no, you can do this comedy course. And I was like, a comedy course? He was like, yeah, stand-up comedy course. So what happens is... You do the course for like six, seven weeks, and then you do a gig, and then you do feedback. It's like three hours on a Tuesday night at Strathclyde Juni. Uh, and I was like, aye, all right. He's like, one will do it. We'll do it together. One will do it. And I was like, aye, aye, okay. And the next morning, obviously we're both hungover, and he's like, do you remember what you agreed to last night? And I was like, oh, aye. Oh, I'm not backing down from a dare. Oh, aye, get that organised. We'll do that. And that's genuinely how it started. I didn't have any intention of telling any of anyone I was doing it. Like, I was going to tell a couple of people and, and they could maybe pop along to the gig and I would do five minutes at the gig and then from that I would I would just carry on my life. And I just kept getting gigs and getting gigs and getting more gigs and getting more gigs. And I didn't go full-time until last October. So I waited until I was kind of headlining the stand and I could sell out solo shows that I was... I felt I could justify saying I was a comedian. Uh, so and, and that was last October. So here we are. You spoke about earlier being on the fringes, and it it just sparked an image of the fringe. Is it madness? It's it's bonkers. It's, uh, I've done the fringe before. Done it two years before. I've done it with the stand, which is the opposite side of town from the kind of where the big hub is with the gilded balloon and pleasance and all that. And the stand's wonderful. The stand's like the Scottish comedy club. It's got one in Newcastle. And it's got Edinburgh and Glasgow. And the stand, once I got in with the stand, they really backed me and they gave me an opportunity to do solo shows and such like that. And it's a great, it's a great comedy club, just a great comedy club. And 
then I decided I had two reasonably successful fringes. They were absolutely fine. And then I went away from it for two years and I toured my solo shows because I felt I wanted to build up an audience. Mm -hmm. I wanted to build up an audience and I wanted to... The Fringe is wonderful for three and a half weeks of performing every night and how much more you learn and how stronger you come out it. But I wanted to go away with my, my shows and do longer than an hour, do an hour and a half, do an hour and three quarters and travel the country, build up an audience, let people see me and see what they thought. And I done that one year with this. It was this, with the Stan Sister Company, the Scottish Comedy Agency, who also run the Glasgow Comedy Festival. And they, we done a year, we done a tour, and then the following year we done the same venues, and the ticket sales went through the roof, and I sold like, I think maybe seven or eight out of the twelve shows, something like that. And that just kind of grew and grew. And then this year, when I went full time, I already had Glasgow on sale, which sold out in a weekend for the comedy festival just passed in March there. And then they said, next year, we're just going to put you in the King's Theatre, which makes me feel physically sick when I think about <laughs> it, because it's terrifying. Uh, going to put your show in there. And then I got signed with a, an agent, quite a big agent. So from that, everything's just kind of spiralled. But yeah, when you're the fringe this year, I kind of feel as if I'm at if, if the stand was my comedy schooling, I kind of feel I'm at the Fringe University. I'm up at Assembly at the Gardens. I mean, it's still in a small venue, uh, but it's it's lovely and you're in that hub and the shows have been selling out every night and the reviews have been great and everything's just suddenly all f kind of fell into place with regards to the Fringe because it's a cruel mistress, mm -hmm. the Fringe. You know, it's a, it's a long run. It's a difficult run. And if you get into a rut, with a bad show, you sometimes can't get yourself out of it and you're mm. stuck there. And it's also expensive. And the chances of you making any money are, are slim to none. So what you do then is you then do other gigs in the city. You then get booked Aye. by the stand to do a Best of Scottish or by the Assembly to do Best of the Fest. So you then, so not only are you dealing with your show, but you're then running to other gigs which will pay you cash or give you backs so that you've got money for that month to get your get you through because your show's not making you anything essentially it's it's really just industry exposure mm -hmm. growing up laura i always think about you know billy conley right you kind of you're raised on billy conley uh -huh. and then you've got uh, guys coming along like uh, frankie boyle and mm -hmm. kevin bridges Great Scottish comedy, mm -hmm. and it, it actually translated to a national and international kind of market. Yeah. Who were you brought up on? Who made you laugh? Connolly. I think we're all brought up in Connolly, I think. And if you're not brought up on them, you should have a word with your parents. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Connolly. Just uh, just that raconteur storytelling, you know. And that's, uh, when I say that's what I do, I certainly do not mean to that standard mm -hmm. or quality. But that's my style. That's that's what I do. Uh, Connolly for me, I really like a lot of Frankie stuff. I've always really liked his stuff. I love Kevin. He bets. Kevin's a really good guy, and he's been really good to me as well, coming through. And he's gave me some pointers, and he's spent a bit of time with me. And he's just generally one of the nicest guys you could meet. And he absolutely loves the hoops. That is completely genuine. How much he loves the hoops. Uh, and then you've got people like Cathy Burke, you know, Cathy Burke, yeah. just a very, very funny woman. And then I also used to like things like Reeves and Mortimer, stuff like that, absolutely. Uh, there'll be some of your listeners going, what is she Reeves and Mortimer about? was proper out there. Pro oh, I, I, mental, like proper off the wall stuff. Like before the League of Gentlemen was the League of Gentlemen, that was that was almost like a precursor. Uh, so, so stuff like that. And then having an older brother, you kind of get that culture fed down to you, don't you? You know, like I was the only eight year old who had a Joshua Tree album, you know, and, and I was, you know, into Reeves and Mortimer and into Absolutely. And I remember like Mark used to come in on a Friday night and I would, I would just be kicking about my room and he'd be like, Do you want to come and watch Friday Night Live? And it was like Ben Elton, Joe Brand, Julian Clary. This is. This was alternative comedy at its height. I didn't know it was alternative. I know it really made me laugh. Spitting image. The young like, ones. Oh, the young ones. <laughs> yeah, even only fools and horses, mm. you know. Like, 
It's the only show that I can think of that had two theme tunes that both described the show, one at the start and one at the end, and and the dynamic in that show, and oh, just just tremendous writing, you know, and that's important. That's important. And people, I remember people saying, like they were talking, was it maybe Cathy Burke or was it Harry Enfield? One of them were getting interviewed and they said that Harry Enfield poked fun at the working class with Wayne and Wayne Etta. And I was like, yeah, but he also poked fun at, at the upper class with Tim Nice But Dim and the, the upwardly mobile lower middle class to then upper middle class who were like, you know, I've got considerably more money than you. And, you know, he looked at society and he, he picked it apart. And I think as a stand up, that's I think that's our job. I think that's what we're meant to do. We're the, I feel that's what we do with the court jesters. Like, I, I very much talk about my own personal life and I put it out there. And and obviously when you're at the fringe, you've kind of got a message. I'm doing, like, quotations, if you like. <laughs> uh, you've kind of got a message and I do I do talk about that in the show, but that's that's our job, you know. And these, these things, growing up in that culture, again, the 1980s, the... the the early to mid nineties, you know, the country was falling to bits. It was going through massive, massive change through Thatcherism. You had the establishment, you had the the working class, you had the alternative, and that's where great music, great comedy, and arts came through. You know, and then that's why we ended up with the whole cool Britannia thing. That's where that then came in because suddenly we'd all had enough of conservatism. Everyone had rioted in the streets for the poll tax in one way or another. And then, God rest John Smith, uh, he would have been a great leader. But then suddenly we had a cool guy that became leader of the Labour Party and we had a generation coming through saying, I've had enough, I've had enough. And then you had things like Liam Gallagher in the front of Time magazine, you know, with Patsy Kensett and Tracy Emin, you know, you know, and, and um, Damien Hurst. You know, then they were all coming through, you know, um, even people like Keith Allen, Billy Allen's dad, you know, yeah. like they coming through and things like uh, Quadrophenia and all that kind of all came back through, you know, and, and that, again, coming from the oppressed classes yeah. from north of Watford up, because that's who it was. It was Liverpool, Newcastle, Manchester, Glasgow. We were getting a kick in all through that time and through that time, the other side of it came, the art, and that that's that's so important. See when you you think of some of the names that we've mentioned, Scottish comedians, absolute you know yep. phenomenal mm -hmm. Scottish comedians, and you think back to New Year and looking forward <sighs> to some of these fantastic <laughs> comedy shows. What is it about the Scots then? If we're talking about oppression and, and comedy and poking fun at yourself, we've had some fantastic comedians, haven't we? Oh yeah, I mean. Like you can go back to Chick Murray, you can go back to Stanley Baxter, you know, Francie and Josie. I mean, if, who doesn't remember Wright Sterling out the car? You know, the old, the old Scotch and Rye, uh, Tony Roper, you know, a great comedy writer, right. Tony Roper, great. I mean, Phil Differ. Oh, fantastic. Phil's been on the show. Great guy. Brilliant. Mr. Hugmany, Phil used to be called. And you notice when Phil no longer done that job that the Hugmany. Went through the aye, floor, aye. Um, you know. Ricky Fulton, you know. You're ultimately we have had great Scottish comedians, but ultimately, to a certain extent, we have been oppressed. Again, do you, know, you know, we're not the establishment. We we are unhealthy. Our food is terrible. Our diet's terrible. Our lifestyle's terrible. Our weather is terrible. And from that, because nobody ever finds humour and happiness. Nobody. Like, if your life is really good, you've not really got much to moan about on a stage or, or, or to poke fun at or to turn and, and hold a mirror up to things. You, you can't do that. And again, I think it comes from that dark... And the Scots, as much as what I was saying about the Celtic thing and the Catholic thing and whatever else, like, I also think like we're, we're quite a dour nation. You know, like, you go out with the west of Scotland and you've got... That west coast, and it's absolutely stunning, and, and we've got the highlands and islands where they still don't put a kettle on a Sunday sometimes, right? And you come down the east coast, and it is it's very different. If you're in Angus compared to Glasgow, it's two different two different worlds. You're in Glasgow, you're in Edinburgh. You're better going to Newcastle if you want a city that's like Glasgow, because, you know, and we're, we're very different, but we can be quite dour, 
miserable Calvinists like the Reverend I Am Jolly. We we hello, like that is that is a thing that's within the Scottish psyche, in certain parts of Scotland. And then you've got the part that we are in the West, where you've got the obviously the the Irish immigration and and just generally immigration. You know we have a big Chinese community, Italian, Polish. All that contrib- contributes to a melting pot. And that's the one bit of Scotland that I would say is a real melting pot when you walk about it. And I think that and that kind of dour, dreek, Calvinistic kind of outlook when you mix it together, there is humour, whether we like it or not, you know. Last night I done a gig in the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. 800 people. It was a riot. <laughs> and I was walking in going, I've just done... Two gigs in the Freemasons Hall and one in the General Assembly. Am I even a Catholic anymore? <laughs> like, what's, <laughs> what's going on? I had to go to confession the day. No. <laughs> oh, I'm always interested in the process. I see people presenting their work or their art or their skills, and I wonder, how does that happen? Because it's so well, it has to be planned. Obviously, mm. there's spontaneity involved in what you do. So I remember reading a, a great interview with Irvin Welsh, and he said that if he was ever lacking a wee bit of motivation or inspiration, he'd jump on a train. And he would just write in his observations, not knowing, you know, how relevant they're going to be, but and just to get the creative juices flowing, you know. Conley used to do that. Conley used to sit in buses and just sitting in the top deck of a bus when you still die, top deck, <laughs> so just all the smoking <laughs> and all the, all the whinging. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've got my notes in my phone that I'll put because we've always got a phone on you, and I've always got um, notepad and pen. And I'll think about things, I'll, or I'll, I'll observe things, or I'll see something, or maybe even hear something on TV, and I'm like, that's 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 weird, that's not right. And then try and deconstruct it and look at it another way and go, there's there's humour in that, or um, like even just just simple things like conversations, like conversations with my mum throw up so much comedy because it's just everyday life conversations with you, with your mates or with your family it just stuff you know and just general stuff and just looking at it and going I'm going to I'm going to take a note of that you know I'm going to take a note of that and I'm, I'm going to kind of work that into something and then you'll maybe use it as a line and, and then it kind of grows and you tell the story and then you you go right that's a story with a punch I'm going to go back and now punch this up so that at the end of every sentence I have a thing which might be a punchline or a tag or a comparison or something to help paint that picture. But yeah, 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 you're just constantly on it, on it all the time. You so. spoke about doing this course uh, over a, a drunken conversation. You made a deal and you, you went and done it. But earlier in your life, things were being fed to you, as you say, from your elder brother and comedy and things like that. Where do you take it next? You're, you're successful, you're touring. What happens next for you? I think I would just like to get my head down. I'd like a, you know, like a successful national tour. That's, I think, I would never, I would never want, like, Kevin and Frankie's level of fame because they literally can't walk down a street, right? And I, I've seen them with the public and they're amazing. They're amazing with the public and it's a, it's a lesson to learn. I remember... Fred McCauley actually telling me he learned to deal with the public by working with Ali McCoist. Is that right? Because of the way McCoist would conduct himself. Celtic fans, Rangers fans, McCoist was just McCoist. I actually met McCoist on a flight coming back from Australia where I'd been out doing the Perth and Adelaide fringes. And he was on the flight and he was sat next to my girlfriend. We had booked the flights at separate times so she was in a different seat. And when I got off the plane at Glasgow, I was waiting at the baggage carousel. And she was like, come on over. And I was like, come on over. And she was like, come on over and meet Ali. He really wants to meet you. And he was the most charming, charismatic man. And he, and it was the same with Strachan. Strachan was in the stand one night in, when he was Scotland manager. And I came off stage and he was like, that. oh, loved it. And just told me all about his love for comedy. And then I told him all about my love for Celtic. Right? And it, it just, just wonderful. But... For me, yeah, I don't want... I want to still be able to go out for dinner with my friends or with my, my missus and just just have a nice time. And, and you know, if you're recognised, you're recognised, but you're not dealing with that constant mobbing where national tours, the theatres are my absolute dream to play because theatres are amazing. Like, see that King's Theatre? 
I've done support slots on it for like twenty five minutes, half an hour, and it's 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 just right there in front of you. And I think it was Conley who said it was just like the inside of a big wedding cake. You know, it's beautiful, and that for me is where I would aspire to be. But to go national through the UK, I would probably need some form of television exposure and some Radio 4 and that kind of stuff because they're the people that come to shows. Radio 4's listen to a working class Roman Catholic lesbian. Come on in. You'll love me. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. And finally, tell us how we can get tickets for your show, what you're doing in the next few weeks. So I go on tour in the autumn with my new show, Born Believer, which is the show that's going to the King's Theatre. Outstanding Susie It's been a pleasure To speak to you today Thanks so much Hopefully we'll do it again sometime Thanks very much For being on A Celtic State of Mind Magic Hail hail A Celtic State of Mind Can be found at Axom.net We're sponsored by Fansbet The betting company By fans For fans 